In the previous episode, we explored some solid reasons to consider the expanding Earth model. In this episode, we will see if an expanding Earth can give an alternative explanation for the fluctuations in early Earth's climate and whether it can explain why our rotational pole has and is wandering. A classic problem of climatology is the warm and equable climate that the Earth experienced in long lapses of geological time. In the Mesozoic, the absence or extremely reduced size of the polar caps has been reported together with the presence of fossils of bacteria that thrive in extremely high temperatures found in both the Arctic and the Antarctic. Various models have been proposed to overcome this, which would include an exchange between the oceans and the air and an intense poleward oceanic heat flow. These to some extent can explain these anomalies, but the discussion about the validity of this global heat circuit is still open. If we consider that in the Mesozoic time the Earth had a smaller radius, then two things should become apparent. The measurement of the paleo temperatures assumes a fixed radius for the Earth. We could find a range of values from the equatorial temperatures to temperate ones, the last of which extend too much towards the pole. On an expanding Earth, the polar ice caps become smaller and smaller with respect to the continents as we move backwards in time. As we move forwards, the ice caps will become larger with respect to the continents. Changes in the radius of the Earth and the impact of the rotation rate. One of the main arguments for a fixed radius planet was the belief that a substantial increase in the size of the planet should have an observable effect on the rotation dynamics. A doubling of the Earth's radius would have caused a halving to the length of day, which is not reflected in the paleontological data, and was yet another reason for its exclusion. There is, however, more to this subject than meets the eye. Scalera investigated this problem and came up with the following. If the radius of the Earth is assumed to be 3300 kilometers in the Triassic, then the estimated annual rate of radius increase is 14 millimeters per year. So surely it must be possible for us to detect this expansion with satellites. Here it is important to understand how some of these measurements are made. Some of these measurements show no increase and some even a slight contraction. Many of these figures use GPS and the VLBI data, which obviously assumes a fixed radius. In an expanding Earth model, not every point is expanding away from every other point. Instead, there are areas where tears appear and this pushes the remaining slab in a direction. As the volume increases, this slab will continue to move, but its curvature will slowly decrease. Now, there will be a much bigger difference if the location you choose to measure these on is on different slabs, for example, one side of the Pacific versus the other side. The selection of the geodetic station will therefore have an influence on your ability to detect the minimum or near zero rate expansion. By carefully selecting the sites to remove this anomaly and leaving the radius as a free parameter, Garisimenko was able to show that the Earth is expanding at a rate of 4 mm per year. This is a much lower value than the predicted 14 mm per year. Of course, this assumes a constant value, and it may well be that the rate of expansion was much higher in the early Cretaceous period, and a slow down, or possibly that it is pulsed. Now back to the problem of the slowed rotation. There are two factors we must consider, the increased radius and also the increase in mass. Both could cause the speed of rotation to reduce. The latter, depending on where it is, may also provide a positive contribution to the spin rate, and thereby may counteract the reduction in the spin rate to some degree. Scalera calculated what the upper limit might be if this mass was extruded asymmetrically. He makes some broad assumptions about the amount of mass accreted, but points out that this is conjecture at this point, as we do not know the amount of mass accreted per year, nor its initial mass. He was able to show that the mass would cause the Earth to slow down at a rate of 0.1 milliseconds per century. If this was deposited in a symmetrical way, this would rise to 20 milliseconds per century. The actual rate is about 2.4 milliseconds per century. 
It is important to realise that an oblate Earth undergoes three other secular deformations other than glacial rebound. The first is due to an increase in inner density, and this could cause less oblateness. The second is a decrease in the length of day, which effectively means it would spin less quickly, and this would also affect the oblateness, causing this to decrease. The final one, though, is pure expansion. If we add all of these together, it can result in a planet with an equator nearly equal to the initial one and a growing polar diameter. At least a partial contribution to the compensation of the slowing down could be provided from the variations in each of these, and it is important to realise that no one knows the combined effect on the Earth's rotation and shape over very long lapses of time, nor the effect of other meteorological phenomena such as thermal tides of the atmosphere, which can act as a force that opposes the slowing down of the rotation of the planets, an effect considered of particular importance for the rotation story of the planet Venus. The Wandering Pole We know that the rotation pole is slowly drifting towards 79 degrees west, at a speed of more than 10 centimetres per year. Standard plate tectonics cannot easily explain this, as most plates create a motion which causes changes in a longitudinal direction, but creating changes in a latitudinal direction is much harder, especially considering the speed of this motion. The only mainstream explanation for this motion is a process called glacial rebound. The main problem with this model is the estimation of the extension of the thickness of the paleo ice caps on Canadian and Siberian shields respectively. Also, this rebound would only last for a few million years, at best, and the true polar wander has been active for hundreds of millions of years. By examining the global pattern of the mantle flow, we can see that there are major upwellings of mantle material under the Bouvet, Indian and Pacific triple points, with pipes whose cross-section is proportional to the ocean floor expansion rate. By analysing the motion of the polar wander, Scalera is able to show that this motion was composed of the motion of three different sums acting together. If we assume that these upwellings are the main areas of expansion, and assume that the smaller ones contribute to a quarter, we can see that the sum of these points is the same direction as the polar wander. This would seem to indicate that the expansion rate was not uniform across the globe, and may well explain why the Pacific floor has expanded faster than any other. He hypothesized that the Pacific superplume has slowly migrated from its Triassic position near Asia in the Northern Hemisphere towards its current location in the Southern Hemisphere, under the Nazca Triple Point. Both the pattern and the ages of the Western Pacific Ocean floor volcanism and the Darwin rise appear as the trace of the slow southeast displacement of the superplume. In a fixed radius Earth, it is hard to explain why the rotation poles would migrate in the first place. In an expanding Earth, they must migrate. If we expand the Earth asymmetrically, with the expansion centered on the equator, the poles will start to drift towards the zone of maximum expansion with an equal rate. If Scalara is right, then this superplume could be responsible for the output of the additional material for the Earth's expansion, and that this expansion was not uniform. In this case, the majority of this additional material would be created in the Southern Hemisphere and could lead to a difference in the rate of wander between the North and the Southern Hemisphere. This could be a simple test of this model. Sadly, we only have data for the wandering of the North Pole. If we examine the rate of this wander over time, then we also see that it is not a linear motion. Around 50 million years ago, there was a sudden slowing down which cannot be explained in the conventional model. In Scalara's model, this is explained by the fact that at that point the plume crossed the equator, and this would cause the rate to decrease to an almost zero value until it passed the equator. Therefore, the poles wander as a direct consequence of the expansion of the Earth itself. And the reasons that we see climatic change may well be due to the fact that the Earth itself has got larger, creating larger and larger poles. 
As always, be brave, be curious. The truth is waiting for us. Until next time.